at for several years, and we're working with many partners to try to figure out if we can redesign these linear canals into more streamlined function and reduce nutrients as the water flows through our drainage system. So we think we can do that. Chesapeake Bay does it. And in terms of HABs, what I say is the best time to reduce nutrients is yesterday, but today's a good day. We all have a nutrient footprint. We all need to reduce it. There's more and more people. There's more and more nutrients. They feed HABs. Sorry to run late. No, it was great. I shouldn't have cut you off because you said a lot of great things. So thank you, well, panelists. I still got another page. <laughs> I hope that we can get to those. And if we didn't, I'd like to hear at the end what else you would like to say. So don't forget about your closing remarks. That would be great for that. So Armando's going to turn over to the next question. Yes. So the next question that we have for you is, from your research experience, what are the most important variables impacting hats? Frequency, intensity, and duration. We can start with um, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, with our work at homeowner associations, it is absolutely clear that um, fertilizer and grass clippings are our biggest enemy. Um, it's where, again, I'm not dealing with saltwater algae, just in, in freshwater environments. And when the, um, for instance, when the fertilizer band, you know, the, the two ends of the fertilizer band come up, um, as soon as we see fertilizer application and a big rain, we can count on algae blooms, not necessarily harmful algae blooms, but explosive algae growth in the, in the stormwater ponds, um, probably five to 10 days after the fertilization. And I should say after the rain, after the fertilization. And we also see that during the rest of the time when fertilizer can go down, if there's a rain within two days, 48 hours of application of fertilizer, we see the same bloom of, of algae. So obviously in, in my work, it's much more, people are concerned about aesthetics far more than health. Um, you know, I rarely look at the health issues in regards to the algae that, that we work on, um, but the, um, we get complaints frequently of people saying they, they are getting sick from the algae and, and I'm sure that occasionally people have an allergic reaction but I know that the algae that, that is prolific in their lake, um, at least I have not found you know, history in the literature of health problems directly from that algae, especially airborne particles of the algae. But I, I'm sure that people have allergic reactions. So whether they hate it because it's ugly or they hate it because it makes their, their nose stuffy, um, you know, a lot of what we deal with is strictly the aesthetic part. And we, we really don't want to see people putting in harsh chemicals um, to try and, you know, make something look aesthetically different. Um, our company pushes um, a probiotic rather than an antibiotic approach. We want to have a probiotic and adding microbial formulas um, to be able to get the lake healthy rather than using an antibiotic, an algicide chemical approach that just kills the algae. And, and in our environment, your environment, your backyards, I mean, what we find is you know, we can kill algae. And the problem is when we kill the algae, we kill all the snails, clams, and those things that clean the water. But also, what does that algae become? It becomes algae food for the next generation. So we're we spend so much time trying to get people to not use harsh chemicals and be sort of more ecologically sensitive and, and you know, make their lakes really healthy ecosystems that they're proud of. Um, I look at the lake in your backyard as, as the living laboratory that you can enjoy nature. And when we do that, we see, you know, not only more snails and clams, we also see more birds, more butterflies, more frogs, and there's almost always a distinct improvement in the use of the habitat by all the wildlife that frequents the, the neighborhood. That's, a, that's my background. Does that answer everything you wanted? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. We'll just move down the line and circle back to John. Can you repeat the question? Yes. So from your research experience, what are the most important variables impacting HABs? Frequency, intensity, and duration. Okay, so all algae blooms, harmful algal blooms included in that, 
require three things. They require light because algae are plants and they photosynthesize. They require um, optimal temperature. They prefer warm temperatures, which is why Florida is such a great place for algae. Um, and they require nutrients as a food source. So um, we know that locally, nationally, and globally, harmful algal blooms are increasing. This isn't a thing that's an event or a phenomenon that's specific to Florida. And so other than light intensity isn't really changing, temperature is warming to some extent and will continue to rise. But really, of the three, what has changed the most in the past 100 years is nutrients. And that's attributable to human activity. And so um, really, the, I think the take home message is that the intensity, the duration, the geographic spread is all due to human activity and the increase in nutrients that we are putting into our fresh and marine ecosystems. Thank you, that's great. Now we're gonna figure out what else to say. Yeah. 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 Uh, but anyways, yeah, so at least you hit it. Um, so I guess that's more or less not for my research, just what is the world of facts. You know, that's that the question is like from your from your research is that those are just your experience. Yeah. No, but um but no, what I can just talk about real quickly is I'm finished well, I just finished a study in Chile working um, on lakes that are found in urban areas with forest plantations and natural parks and and um, so it was looking at watershed map, what the way the watershed is used and uh, the effects on the phytoplankton community within a thousand kilometer gradient from because Chile's long and everything in the mountains. So what well, yeah, what we did see is I mean so we talk about Florida, you know, Florida here, but it's like like Lisa said, it's not just a Florida problem. And there was an increase of uh, both temperature, you know, have the role like Lisa said. But again, these data, our data show that the watershed use going from a more native forest plantation, a forest, forest um, that was, had a very nice, um, very uh, balanced system, because what happens when you get halves, halves are unbalanced, that unbalanced system, right? Because usually everything's growing, you know, like harmoniously, you know, in, in this, but when you, when you alter it with the nutrients and the temperature, that's when one thing grows more than the other. But it's never just one, there's a lot more. But anyways, going back to what I was saying without being long-winded, um, that we, that where there were forest plantations, so you know, uh, planted forests where the urban shed, urban area increased, those were places that we saw an increase of cyanobooms, blooms, right? Um, where the other ones were the diatoms, and then some green algae, and the cinerophytes, and other, other big names, I can say they're beautiful, beautiful, dives are beautiful, um, and, um, but you know, there's weeds. But anyway, so, um, well, that's, that's what we saw. So again, like you're saying, watershed management, so we, so it's a watershed because what you do, you know, it's the whole watershed use, not just what I do in my, at my home. You know, it's, it's because of the way the drainage spaces are. So I guess what, what I'd say is that it's, you know, everything that Lisa said, but including look at a, at a larger view and the whole watershed view to see exactly what's happening in, in the lakes around. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, a little more. A little more complicated than some other uh, causative factors. So, um, a lot of it really depends on on the type of habitat we're talking about. And uh, you know, there's there's definitely a very clear distinction between um, freshwater harmful algal blooms and those that occur in a marine system, and especially like a, what we have here, basically a coastal ocean where there's a lot of other dynamics going on. Um, somewhat together with the, the freshwater bodies, you can maybe group in estuaries, partly because they tend to be a bit more closed off, so you can get a lot of nutrients empty into these estuaries, much like you can a freshwater body, and that can exacerbate um, your, your problems. You know, you might have certain harmful species present, and they can't really do anything. They're kept in check by competition with the rest of the phytoplankton community, and so they don't really grow, but you throw that out of balance by adding certain nutrients into those you know, more restricted flow water bodies, and then you can get a bloom. And we see this on the east coast of Florida, where we have something that's referred to as a brown tide, a uh, genus called Warrior Umbra. That's not really important, but um, this is a type of uh, another group of phytoplankton altogether called pelagophytes. Um, that are not really thought to be toxic as far as we know currently, but they do form um, very dense biomass and that can choke out seagrasses and so forth. So in those kind of issues, with some of the estuarine halves and certainly the freshwater halves, you know, there's, a, there's a very, very clear tie to nutrient input. When you get to coastal systems, they're very, very dynamic. 
And so you have um, what I think is probably, and a lot of research has, has demonstrated, like for example, for our Florida red tide, Carnia brevis, is that it might actually be the, uh, the coastal circulation, the water circulation, um, which is uh, multifaceted. You have the, the loop current that's out in the main part of the Gulf, but that can push water onto the shelf. You have shelf flow itself that can um, change directions. And so it's, it's um, a lot of times when we see a bloom of Carnia brevis, it's not necessarily growing in place, but the cells are growing and they get pushed together by currents. And that's when we see these, these dense, the dense expression of the bloom at the surface near the coast. Um, so that's probably what I would say is the, the biggest influence for our Florida red tide. Now, as I, I mentioned during my opening remarks with uh, all harmful algal blooms, you have that combination of the chemistry, the biology, and the physics. And the, phys the physical can include, um, you know, the chemistry and, and physics includes uh, the nutrients as well as the temperature and the sunlight, and also that, that water movement, that movement of the currents. Um, and uh, the University of South Florida has done a great job exploring some of that, and they, they tied uh, the currents of red tide to, um, to a certain position of the loop current. And that worked pretty well when they hindcast it, but it, it also fails sometimes and has failed when they were trying to forecast bloom. So there's obviously more to it than that. So it can't just be any one factor, it's certainly a combination of factors. And there's also a lot of unknowns, specifically talking about our Florida red tide, there's a lot of unknowns regarding factors of bloom initiation, um, the, the sustainment of these large biomass blooms as well as bloom termination. So it could be that other, you know, there, every stage of the bloom is gonna have the main factors that control it. And the better we can get at identifying and understanding those factors, then we can maybe, you know, in a, in a perfect world, in a, in a reasonable world, we can get better at predicting and forecasting them, both predicting when they might occur and also when they might go away. In a perfect world, perhaps we can uh, figure out some, how we can maybe shorten the duration of those blooms. Thank you. So, you want? What's the question again? <laughs> um, so, based on your experience and research, what are the most important variables impacting has in frequency, intensity, and duration? Uh, Vince knows all that stuff. So, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to I'm not an expert, but I do know a lot about nutrients. So, I'm going to talk about that. And thanks for mentioning nutrients since that's my spiel. Um, nutrients are, around here we're mostly talking about nitrogen. Nitrogen and phosphorus is normally what people talk about, nutrients feeding algae and other things, including us. And nutrients are part of life. You know, we're all full of nutrients. Um, all living things are full of nutrients, full of nitrogen. So in a normal, we have estuaries here, meaning where fresh water meets salt water, and usually a creek and then a bay. Estuaries are super productive. That's where a lot of life in the ocean originates. They're like, you know when you watch those movies and there's all these fish? There's an upwelling of nutrients there in the ocean. So nutrients create life and a great diversity of life in a healthy estuary. So that's sort of the background to it. But like a person who is malnourished, when you eat, you're healthier. But when you're fat, you're unhealthy. And so that's kind of where we're at, is our oceans are now overweight. They're obese. They're getting fatter. They're more and more unhealthy. So that's why we have to go on a diet. But intrinsically, when everything's right, nutrients are great. They're like water. They're like electricity or any other desirable thing you want. So in nutrient management, the way I see it is there are three big things going on. And this relates very much to HABs. If you look at the world and you say, how are things going? You'll see HABs, and HABs are super diverse. You guys haven't really talked about that. They are often very little alike. They're quite different from each other. So a terrible algae bloom in New England or something is nothing like red tide. They're quite different. They're just small. They have that kind. But HABs around the world are increasing. That's what HAB experts have told me. They believe that there's a worldwide increase in harmful algal blooms. At the same time, there's a worldwide increase in nutrient pollution. It's in all the coastal areas. We see you know, the dead zone from the Mississippi River. There are dead zones all over the place. That's nutrients in excess taking oxygen out of the water. And the third thing that is common throughout the whole world is the oceans are more devoid of life than they used to be. And so the balance is really out. You know, you can think of anything, oysters, sharks, whales, you know, you know. All those different fish that used to be commonplace are now rare. Shellfish, all different forms of life. While the nutrients are present, they will grow something. So in the world, we're seeing an abundance of primitive forms of life that can live in those settings. 
And in fact, I think, and you guys can correct me because you're the experts, in Japan, they have an abundance of jellyfish, a primitive form of life. Kind of a similar story, I think. So if you want to go on a diet, you have to think about where are all the nutrients and kind of add them all up. In my world, we use math, you know, you gotta use math. And um, so we look at three big things. One is storm water, and storm water is rain, falls from the sky, it picks up some air pollution, lands on the ground, flows along and picks up all the pollution of our lives and carries it out into the water. It's a lot of water, it's not very polluted, but because it's so much water, the pollution ends up. Then there's wastewater, that's sewage. So that's our poop and pee, very, very nutrient rich. There's a lot of it, but nowhere near as much as stormwater. So very concentrated, dirty, disease causing, and nutrient rich, it's controlled. It's fairly well controlled. We have either sewer or septic systems. And then the natural systems. So the natural systems, one example here is in Sarasota County, 80% of Sarasota Bay has a seawall. So in a natural system, those nutrients would flow in and they would be taken up by fish and clams and all these different things, shoreline plants, and those are absent. So all those things are at play. And fertilizer is kind of a separate issue, but it gets carried into the water, either through groundwater or through runoff. So I saw a reference document, I was looking it up the other day, and I think in 2012, Sarasota County had I don't remember the number exactly, like 10,000 tons of fertilizer applied, something like that. So the numbers get really big. And whether that's a significant number, you have to compare it to other big numbers. Um, so in the world of stormwater, we try, what we strive to do is, um, well, one thing is, around 1984, we started requiring stormwater ponds. The state of Florida said, okay, we gotta do something with the stormwater pollution. So if you live in a pretty modern subdivision, you have a stormwater pond. That stormwater pond takes about 40% of the nitrogen out. So when it goes from a pasture to a subdivision, stormwater pollution increases. In 2010, there was a proposed rule that said, we wanna have this a break even thing. So when we convert land for the pasture to subdivision, the nutrients don't increase. So there's a way to do that, it didn't end up passing. It was called the statewide stormwater rule. So that's kind of the smart development quality. Places that are already developed, we have to do things, low impact design. I'm gonna run out of time here, I'm yep. not start. <laughs> uh, but what we wanna do is somehow prevent that abundance of water from being either soak it into the ground or we've pumped groundwater out. Um, there are several strategies, but it's quite challenging to change water infiltration in the city. All the big cities are doing it. They're all interested in LID, low impact design. Um, in the wastewater world, there's a really great thing there. There's a thing called denitrification. So if you have wastewater and you run it through primary, secondary, and tertiary, or advanced wastewater treatment, you're able to release nitrogen into the air without causing air pollution. Air is 80% N2, nitrogen gas is not a pollutant. So in this particular case, you can release nitrogen into the air. It's kind of a free shot, it's not free. And it's expensive, but that is one way to take nitrogen out of the, out of the ecosystem where it's too abundant. Thank you, John. The natural system. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to add that natural systems can do it too. And so Florida used to be 70% wetland. So those wetlands were denitrifiers um, by trade, and we have developed over them. So that is well, part of the issue as well. <laughs> I did do the drum. <laughs> I gotta do it louder. Can I have one more comment to that? Yes. It's just because the, the question specifically talks about increases in intensity and duration. So I kind of wanted to bring it back to the blooms that we've experienced this year. It doesn't directly answer the question, but just wanted to say that the red tide, the Karenia Brevis, Florida Red Tide um, has been going on for 11 months now. It started in October 2017. It is not the longest red tide since um, they started monitoring red tides. Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, their um, Florida Wildlife Research Institute is responsible for monitoring marine harmful algal blooms. Since their monitoring began, there have been four other bloom events that have been longer than this one. So this is not the worst one that we've experienced, even though when you see sort of the pictures and images and go on the beach of all the fish kills, it, it seems like it's really crazy. 
Um, we also don't know if it's the most intense. We are unable, the way the database is established, even though it's an extraordinarily long-running database, it started in the mid-1950s, really robust. The way the data co is collected, it's not always consistent, so you can't compare samples year after year. So there's no way to tell, using the database, whether or not the red tides are getting more intense. So it's not the longest running, although it's still going. And we can't say if in Florida red tides are getting more intense. As far as the Lake Okeechobee blue-green algae bloom, this one initiated in um, June of this year, 2018, and it is ongoing. So we don't hear about it often because we're no longer discharging in massive amounts to the west and east coast, but there is still a bloom that's covering Lake Okeechobee. They don't have a monitoring database for Lake Okeechobee. The South Florida Water Management District has monitoring of Lake Okeechobee, but um, there's no way to sort of see the records and see how long uh, duration the algal blooms normally persist, but six months is a pretty long time. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Dale, did you want to add to that? Well, I was out on Lake Okeechobee last week, and because um, and I work a lot with the Army Corps, and, and, and you guys also get go up um, in, the, like, in the Army Corps, you get the satellite and you should see how it is, you probably get it as well, and just want everything. And, um, no, thank you. And just, I was out there, and then one thing we, you talk about more or less with bioplanet ecology is that the species the, the species change over time. For example, at the beginning, it was mostly Mycosis aeruginosa, but Mycosis species is more than one morphal species in there. And now, this last one I went was Dolipus sperma cisternati, which was actually an adena that gives some nitrogen. So this is when we start going, at, when you know, got this comment, and you commented, the complexity of the community. So the, the bloom is still there, however, the bloom has changed, which means the toxins that would be, that, that could be, the, the potential public health issues have changed because the, there are different organisms producing different things. Okay, so that, that's what it is. So sometimes it's more neurotoxic, sometimes it's more hepatotoxic, Maybe they're dermatotoxic, you know, um, oh, so it depends liver, brain, or skin, right? And we're going to get more into that in one second, but I wanted Vince to have the opportunity to comment um, on the red tide issue that Lisa brought up. Sure, uh, that, that was a great point, and uh, that's true, and we have, um, I won't try to say dates because I might not have them quite right, but I know in the 50s there was a long one, and in the 90s there was a long one. Um, one of those was about 18 months, one was about 20 months. Um, even somewhat more recently, in 2012, there was that one was about I think maybe a week or nine months, which seems very short in comparison. And there's historical records that suggest in the in the I think it was in the 1870s we had a period of, of about 10 years where we had very frequent blooms. Now not one bloom that lasted 10 years, but very frequent blooms over a 10-year period. So this bloom, the our red tide has been going on for a long time, and that's why you know we often say to the public that you know. We believe it's natural, you know, not just the organism here, but also the occurrence of these of these massive blooms. Um, now this is a pretty massive one, and it has been intense, and it has killed a lot of organisms, but to, to put that, you know, we say, is it the worst one ever, or are they getting worse? You know, some of it, you have to define what you mean by worse, and then you also have to have a good metric that you can measure, or that you have measured that you can compare, and as Lisa said, that's very, very difficult to do, because our, our ability to monitor has changed and continues to change. Um, you know, in the, in the 1950s, there were some uh, experiments trying to apply uh, copper sulfate to blooms to try to get rid of them. There was a lot of monitoring associated with that. Then for a period of about 30 years, there was very little monitoring. It all be very event related. So there would be a bad bloom and then people would very, very limited, but they'd go out and sample. And then it wasn't until probably the mid to late 90s that there was finally some funding in place that allowed for an actual monitoring program to start. And even that has changed over the years. Even the monitoring we do at MOAT has increased over the years because we get better abilities. And now we're developing these um, more autonomous ways of, of uh, collecting data, like gliders, and we're even starting to explore using drones, and that's gonna change the way we monitor as well. So it's very, very difficult to, to make that assessment of our, our wounds in that case getting worse. You have to have consistent data. Now on the other hand, we're now working on having you know 25 years or so worth of somewhat more consistent data, certainly more consistent than the 30 years prior. So you know that is something to revisit because it is a, it, it's a valid question. Are they getting worse? Because um, while I I you know suggested that for our Florida red tide for Karenia brevis, 
um, the evidence seems to suggest that water circulation is a huge part of it. That doesn't mean the other factors don't play in. And certainly as blooms get closer to the coast, you know, that there are nutrients there and they can use them. It's just that currently, and people are working on this, we don't have the data to say exactly what that influence is. It doesn't mean there's no influence. We just don't, we can't define it yet. Great, thank you. So now we're gonna to turn to a question from the audience. Question is, what are the known health problems associated with red tide, short or long term? And not everybody has to answer if you want to, but what are the known health problems associated with red tide, long and short term? So we already know, so the question said red tide. I guess we can address both. We can broaden it out a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not the uh, the health expert when it comes to red tide, but um, of course the. Uh, uh, so bromotoxin basically affects people in two ways. Uh, it can either be through ingestion or through inhalation. Um, so there's a little bit of a misconception that I'll try to clear up. Uh, so when, the, when we talk about the aerosols, it's not the red tide itself. It's not the cells that are becoming and they, that are making it to the air. It's the toxin. So aerosols form all the time anyways. That's why you get a film of salt on everything that gets near the, the ocean. Um, but when there's, and, and that's, that salt particle um, started out as a water droplet, and it has everything in it that the ocean has in it. And when there's red tide and there's toxins in the water, then that droplet of water is going to have toxins in it. Um, as that water evaporates and you have this little granule of, of salt, it's going to still have those toxins in it. So we inhale it and then we get that blast of toxins. Uh, the ingestion route is primarily through eating contaminated shellfish. Shellfish are filter feeders. Um, they're passing water through their um, bodies and they're basically filtering out any particles that are there. If those part of, a lot of those particles are red tide or crazy redness, then they're going to collect those in their gut. When we eat shellfish, we're usually eating the entire thing, not just the, the flesh, so we get the guts and everything, and all that blast of toxins. So that's how we get, um, get the uh, exposure through ingestion. Um, now, the effects uh, through ingestion can be uh, our, our gastrointestinal, uh, primarily, um, you will feel really, really horrible. Now, I'm happy to say that that doesn't happen very much, especially when you're eating commercially purchased shellfish. Um, recreational shellfish, of course, is a different story. You should very much pay attention to the, the status of where you're, you're harvesting your um, shellfish recreationally. Um, aerosols are a little harder to avoid um, if you're, the, the toxins can travel. Um, we generally tend to say a mile because that's kind of the average, but some of the work done uh, by Mo and, and collaborators earlier actually suggests it might be two miles or more. And we're actually repeating some of those studies now. Because um, the thing about scientific studies is, you know, you get a shot, you have your, your period to do your work, you do your work, you collect your data, and you make your conclusions. You don't necessarily get to collect the data under the most ideal conditions and as much data as you would like, you're always restricted. Um, so those studies are being repeated currently. Um, Dr. Rich Pearson is, is leading that. Um, as far as long-term effects, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, I would say something's about sanitary bacteria. I have experts, people that are more expert at it than me, so I'll let them speak to it. Um, but with uh, the revitoxin, there's a lot that we don't know about long-term exposure. Um, fortunately, we often don't have long-term exposure because blooms like this are, are pretty rare and hopefully will remain rare. So that's future research to be done. Can I just expand on that question? Yeah. Um, so Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer uh, Services, Services, Sciences, Services? That's <laughs> <Yeah, that's, laughs> I think it's services. Um, are the one who monitor the shellfish harvesting areas in the state. They work with FWC who monitors the water. And so when there are more than 5,000 cells of red tide in the water, they'll close down the uh, commercially harvested shellfish areas. So this is your clams, your oysters, those bivalves. Um, and that's how you can guarantee that when you are purchasing something at a restaurant or in a grocery store from Florida that it's safe to eat. Um, and as Vince mentioned, um, the, the lovely name for the ingested is paralytic shellfish poisoning. So um, it's not fatal, but it's uncomfortable. We're <laughs> so I right hear. Um, scallops are not managed by FDAX. They're managed by FWC because they're a fishery. And it's the same thing. They can also have um, paralytic shellfish poisoning. So FWC 
will close down harvesting areas. The scallops, unlike an oyster or a clam, you don't always eat the entire animal. You tend to just eat the white mussel. So as long as you're harvesting um, recreationally or commercially from an open area, open area, they're safe to eat. Same thing with fin fish. Um, the, the brevitoxin does not concentrate in the tissue or the muscle, uh, concentrates in the liver. So you can eat the, the muscle, you can eat the tissue, stay away from the liver. And that goes the same for other shellfish like crabs and lobsters that have a hepatopancreas which acts as a liver in those organisms. So it's safe to consume the muscle as long as you don't eat um, what some people consider a delicacy, that sort of orangey tamale. Stay away from the tamale. <laughs> um, and of course, yeah, it doesn't really need to be stated, but if there is something washed up, doesn't look so healthy, or is dead, stay away. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Dale, would you like to add um, to the health impacts of Cyanobacteria? Okay, so cyanobacteria. Um, so, yeah, so some good at uh, So, for, in general, you know, cyanos have thousands of compounds, you know, bioactive compounds. Some can be, some are toxic. Based. Well, what is a toxin? Toxin is on the eye of a holder, right? Because something that's toxic for me might be toxic for you guys, right? That has to do with, say, for example, um, peanuts, right? And you were talking about how, um, how different compounds are toxic for Yes. So for let's say microcystins, what we talk about a lot, um, they're about documented 200, people that work with microcystins at 800 different compounds. Um, so 800 variants of the known compounds. So microcystins one compound, 800 different variants, so who cares what the many variants are? Um, it means that each variant may have a, a thousand fold difference of toxicity, plus you guys have to be toxic to one and not the other, right? So it's like, oh, I, 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 I'm supposed to, what are things happening to me? Well, um, and you can say, well, if you, you know, somebody might be allergic, you might be allergic, it might be a compound, like nitrogen and LR, you know, LR are always YR, whatever, are the proteins that are, that, that are associated. If you see Mickey LR, Mickey RR, Mickey YR, that LR, YR, if you go in, the, in Google proteins, uh, amino acids, excuse me, you can figure out what those mean, and I don't know all of them as well. Um, so that's a pattern. Other one, other, so those are, that's a big pattern toxin. Another one, the saxitoxins, which are like PSPs in the, in the marine system, they're actually two different evolutionary routes. So what's interesting is that the cyanobacteria and the human fly just have evolved. No, I thought you said trash. It's like, that's like, <laughs> um, they have evolved uh, to, uh, more than once it has the same, has the same neurotoxin. What's the problem with neurotoxin? Um, it, well, let's go, uh, let me just finish one thing with the catatoxin, my system. They're a very big molecule and they last a long time in the water. So that's why it's a long time, let's say 10 weeks, um, depending on the water, right? It can be a couple hour or hours or days, if it's very high light, it oxidizes, or we put a, uh, something that oxidizes the water in it. If it's just in a regular water column, it can last about 10 weeks. You know, three weeks at pH one and uh, 40 degrees Celsius. So that's very, that's a long. And that depends on the comp, that depends on the variant again. So, okay, but they're very stable and they are released when the cell opens, okay? So that's, okay, so a neurotoxin, very, very, very small molecule, it has a one to two hour half-life, so only around a couple hours. It is produced all the time, so it's produced even when the cell's still intact. And that's when you have a lot of the uh, deaths of dogs and everything, is because they're eating um, something there that they, they, it's producing, and it is paraly it's paralytic like the other one, so it stops your breathing. It affects the neurons. You know, the hepatotoxin affects um, the, the, the liver, of course, and the dermatotoxins, you know, it just gets the itches. Um, but, uh, but then you have um, other compounds that you can actually use from, from Sio that actually have health benefits like anti-cancer, anti-HIV, um, you know, uh, anti-obesity, uh, a lot of compounds because you're talking about thousands and thousands of compounds. Um, I think that's, and then, I, so that's most of the other ones. We have endotoxins in this, but, but the reason the sign of the, the microcystins are because they're very, they're a long time and they um, can cause tumors and they cause Cancer, and then we have a compound of bacteria called BMAA, which is kind of like you know we talked this has uh, their their toxin. Pro, uh, it's kind of anyways. This um, jury's still out. I'm that's it. Yeah, yeah jury's still out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. But that but the, that has to do you know another time we can tell you the whole story behind it. But anyways, it, it causes problems, problems at like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's people, okay. and that's um, BMAA. 
And then um, we have other ones that are kill ego killers. So there's some that, you know, so it's not just toxic. We have side that actually grow on things like the terrestrial ones. And those are, you know, that's the, the, you have uh, those are producing toxins too. And, um, and they can uptake. So again, side of the top, like certain compounds evolved 3.8 billion years ago. That means that 3.8 billion years and it's been here for that long, these compounds. So anything, any cyanide can, can produce. So watch out, you know, when you Anything with it says blue out. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go back to the supplement really quickly. So, red tide and red toxins we know can be aerosolized. For most people, it's a tickle, a cough, it's uncomfortable, some respiratory irritation. It can be serious for those people with chronic um, issues asthma, emphysema. Stay away. Um, cyanobacteria are microcystin for the, for the um, <coughs> microcystis cerebinosa. We know it can be aerosolized, but we don't know really what the respiratory. Yeah, it's, it's little, little so, um, you know, we still need a lot, a lot of research when it comes to human health impacts of harmful algal blooms in general. So we really need um, a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources to go towards human health. Yeah, and just one, what's interesting with the cyanotoxins that you can be passed from mother to sickly. So, you know, they have, you know, if the, for example, they're studies showing that it passed through the breast milk and also through the, um, from to the eggs, for example, if crocodiles in it, that are, I just spoke of crocodiles, and um, you see that they live in infested areas and, the, and there's, the hashings have deformations. And um, data, for example, the, you know, mice data show, there's a lot of interesting things. It's, it's, you know, we can talk for hours at all of us, but, but, um, but yeah, I'm, of course, I'm saying sign up, so I love them. But um, nothing against the genomes. <laughs> the genomes are pretty, they have a huge genome. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. I hope you guys learned a little bit about the health impacts of various forms of algae. Now, we got a lot of questions. People really want you all to parse out where are the nutrients coming from that create these um, harmful algal blooms. And I know that that's very difficult and complex. I think that what we should um, do then is to think about um, how big of a pie, in your perspective, might be legacy nutrients. And then, let's just start with that. So how big of a piece of the pie, so thinking of all the nutrients that go into the system that feed a hard full algal bloom, how large is the piece or the slice that is legacy nutrients? Things that occur, so for those of you who don't know, legacy nutrients are the nutrients that have occurred a long time ago um, and that are residual in the sediments. So, Sounds like fence monster. <laughs> Not really, but <laughs> well, maybe because that's, that's, that's a good question, but also a difficult question, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, again, you know, the, the dynamics of a coastal bloom like our Florida red tide, the currently brothers. Um, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of divert to the other part of your question about the, the various nutrient sources, and there's been a lot of work done on that, and there's more to do because a lot of, as I mentioned before, a lot of the scientific work you do, you know, you get a period of time to do the work, and you collect the data. Complex, so you make the conclusions that you can make based on that. It doesn't necessarily put the, the exclamation point and the final stamp on it. Um, however, what has been found out, and uh, one really interesting one with uh, red tide is, well, we know it kills fish, um, and the toxin is, is responsible for that, that um, action. But uh, the big thing is, why do the toxins do what they do? Well, some work uh, a few years back um, showed that the, the the amount of biomass that a, a large red tide can kill can actually provide up to 90% of the nutrients needed to sustain that bloom. So it could be, um, now this is based on, you know, on looking at how much uh, fish uh, a bloom can kill and then how, as that fish decomposes, which can happen quite rapidly, how much nitrogen and phosphorus they release and then given a certain area and size of bloom, could you have calculated that out? So it hasn't really been demonstrated in, in place yet, but um, that could be a major source of nutrients for sustaining the bloom. Now, of course, that's not gonna cause the bloom because you have to have a bloom in the first place to kill all those fish. But that's really interesting, especially when you put it in the context of, of nutrients coming from land. Um, so there's been, I think it was a, it's been a dozen or so um, identified nutrient sources that can either initiate or sustain 
a, a red tide bloom, and those um, come from uh, natural and, and uh, uh, anthropogenic force, uh, sources, uh, meaning, meaning man-made. And, but they include a, a type of cyanobacteria. Now this is a marine cyanobacteria called Trichodosmium that grows offshore. Um, it, it is, it's fueled, so the interesting thing about Trichodosmium, I think I'm gonna get the, uh, the drum here soon, I'm gonna get the post it done. Audience question, so Right, so um, the uh, Trichodosmium is unique, not necessarily among cyanobacteria, but among marine phytoplankton that it can fix nitrogen, so it takes nitrogen out of the air. So it doesn't really need a lot of nitrogen in the water. So we tend to find it more offshore because near shore gets competed where there is nitrogen, it gets out competed by other phytoplankton. Um, one of the, what trichodosmium needs though is iron, and iron might come from the saharan dust, that's the saharan dust hypothesis, which some people disagree with, but it does need iron in some way. It might also come from land or through groundwater. Uh, but so trichodosmium can bloom, uh, that bloom dies, releases uh, compound uh, or complex organic nitrogen, uh, forms of nitrogen, uh, amino acids are one of them, and it's, we, we've even shown that, oh, that uh, corinne is really good at using amino acids. A lot of other phytoplankton need those complex uh, organic forms of nitrogen broken down into simpler pieces in order to utilize them. Corinne can utilize them directly. Um, and there's new, numerous other sources, sloppy feeding by zooplankton, feeding on other, um, other phytoplankton, and maybe even feeding on crania itself. As crania dies, it can actually utilize its own nutrients that are released as the cells lice. And of course, there is land-derived nutrients. And as was mentioned before, you know, nutrients are important in our coastal system. The reason we have phytoplankton in our coastal system is because we have nutrients, a, a large portion of which comes from land. Um, and that's a good thing because if we didn't have those phytoplankton, we wouldn't have fish. That was already covered. Um, so you know, there's, a, there's a whole variety of sources of nutrients from land. Um, there's estuarine sources. And, and one of the, um, I'll, I'll make one more point and then pass on the mic. Uh, but one really interesting thing that happened prior to this bloom, we don't quite know what influence it had yet. But if you recall, when Irma came through, we had a lot of uh, the estuaries from Tampa Bay all the way down to Naples, maybe even more, um, have a lot of water flushed out of those, those estuaries and went, came into the coastal water at some residence time to mix around with the coastal water before flowing back in. Now we don't know what influence that had, but um, I'm sure some math could figure out the amount of nutrients that that might have provided to the coastal system. And then a month later, we start to see an increase in perennia um, numbers. So whether or not that had a direct influence and what that influence is, we don't know, but it's definitely worth looking at. So um, I went around and around a bit, but I'll, I'll I, I would like to, to move on. Thank you. I would like to hear from um, Russ and John, if possible. So Russ, specifically in the backyard environment, do you notice um, any changes or any legacy nutrients? Is there, is there anything um, that you notice about nutrient? It puts in how much is just there. It sort of defines, we just lost the microphone. It, it, it sort of defines what you call legacy because in, in our work in the managing stormwater ponds, we find that a, a new stormwater pond um, behaves pretty well. We, we don't get a lot of algae blooms from stormwater ponds that are less than five or six years old. but over the years, um, it, uh, nutrients accumulate in the, in the sediment in the pond. So we have an internal source of, of nutrients in all this, the crud, mostly fertilizer and grass clippings, that came into the pond over the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, depends how old your community is. And those um, significantly affect the algae growth and, and allow the algae to bloom more frequently. Um, and we, we work hard at the, the watershed, and, and in our world, the watershed is basically your community, you know, because the, the water from, in your stormwater ponds doesn't come from five miles upstream, it comes from your neighborhood, your, your streets, your driveways, your yards, your roofs. So we work hard to get communities to reduce the, the nutrients going into the lake by planting a filter zone that intercepts some of the nutrients before it gets into the water um, to, to um, fertilize more responsibly. For instance, we see communities that have reclaimed the water and there's a fair amount of nitrogen in the reclaimed water. So turf areas in particular are being fertilized every single week with, with the irrigation. So we, we encourage them to, when they're calculating their nitrogen needs for the different particular plants, 
that they reduce the nitrogen that the fertilizer applied for the amount of nitrogen that's being applied weekly in the irrigation system. So that's one thing. Um, with uh, um, the loads, once the once the nitrogen is in the lake, you know we've done had some success with microbial processes to reduce the, the nitrogen load and consequently reduce the, the algae blooms. Um, and it, it's not particularly common, but, but we have lakes that we can get, um, you know, see down in the water six feet, you know, see the fish or turtles six feet down, you know, with, with very, very few, if any, algae blooms. So it, it's very possible to clean up the water of that locally. Um, and that's something that, that it, by the comparison to, to what our colleagues here are talking about, our scale is teeny because instead of looking at the Gulf of Mexico, we're looking at a you know one acre stormwater pond behind your house. Um, we can see results there in, in a couple, in sometimes a couple of months, and depending on how old the pond is, a few years. So um, we see uh, uh, overall we we look at landscaping practices as being the cause, um, and you know when they. they nitrogen accumulates relatively quickly in the stormwater ponds, even though overall the stormwater ponds can reduce the nitrogen going out to the, the bay. Uh, as you well know, that some of the ponds have, you know, pretty frequent algae blooms. Great, thank you. And then last, John, would you like to touch on that? Anything about nutrients? Sure. Um, <laughs> legacy nutrients? Well, I <laughs> so I want to ask, Russ, when you um, uh, biologically treat the lakes, do you, do you think it's denitrification that's occurring, or do you think it's um, does the do the nutrients travel downstream from the treatment or the We we know it's a combination, um, and there's from the research we did with Cornell, so um, basically a bioreactor. You know, we know we have denitrification happening, so we 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 did not do. We didn't have the money in our research study to, to actually identify all of the strains of, you know, this down to a species level for what nitrobacters we had growing, which we want to repeat as soon as we find some, you know, funding. Yeah, you're just a little yeah. lake management guy. Yeah. You're publishing but, in formal literature. Yeah. But what, 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 what we did find is that. Um, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> Um, but we do believe that a lot of the nitrogen is being sequestered in, in a microbial population. So basically we're increasing the microbial populations, which is decreasing the algae populations. And the good thing about microbial populations is to the naked eye, it's all invisible. So most people don't care if there's trillions and trillions and trillions of, of microbes in their lake, but they care if there's trillions and trillions and trillions of, of algae cells in the lake because the algae cell is always on the top where it's most visible, whereas the microbes are throughout the water column and, you know, and in the sediment, so it's invisible. Along, along those lines, um, in Sarasota County, we have 6,600 stormwater ponds, or ponds. Pretty much all of them are man-made, or remnant wetland, or something like that. So when you think about that, you say, oh, it's just one little one-acre pond, but really, that's kind of the headwaters of a developed watershed. So it's a meaningful thing. And uh, sometimes incremental things are meaningless. And sometimes they're very meaningful. And here's an example. In Tampa Bay, they do really great work, uh, scientific work on nitrogen pollution. And they, I recently spoke to them in the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and they said, we've seen a 40% reduction in atmospheric pollution, which is very important. It's not a nothing, it's a thing. And it's primarily from cars. Because if you're a white-haired guy like me, and some of you are, you remember the cars of our youth. And it was really common to see smoke on the highways. Smoky emissions were a normal thing. You wouldn't even remark on it. My wife drives a hybrid, and maybe you do too. It's very common. It's not a fringe thing at all. So there's a lot less pollution. If one car is a hybrid as opposed to a 73 Mustang, no meaning, it's meaningless. But if 100,000 people have cars that pollute, pollute less, it matters. And I think that ponds matter. Because if one pond is clean, eh, okay, it's nice for the people who live there. If 6,000 ponds are clean, that matters. That moves the needle. That's what we talk about, moving the needle. And 
that. So I think we have to find opportunities and take them and find reasons other than altruism to do the, the things that we want to do. And I think neighborhoods are a very powerful thing. We have people who work with neighborhoods and I'm just continually impressed with the people that live here. I've yet to find a person who isn't in favor of clean water. So it's a pretty much unanimous thing. So the question becomes really how do we do it? How do we do it cost effectively and I think it moves the needle? And I really think the work that Russ does matters. It matters not because of one God. It matters because the public does that. I might have a comment on one thing with that short, very short, is that the way I look at what John's saying, there's 6,000 stormwater ponds in Sarasota. There's more shoreline in those stormwater ponds than there's shoreline from Jacksonville to New York City. Because when you just calculate the number, the size of ponds, you know, half acre, quarter acre, three acres, and start adding all those up, there, there's an unbelievable amount of shoreline. You might not be able to do something about Karenia Brevis, you know, 10 miles out of the Gulf, but you can do something about your backyard. And that's what I push with our customers all the time, is that I want them to take the pride in saying, I did my fair share, you know, and the water behind my house is cleaner because we're doing these specific practices that we can accomplish that. That's a great deal of pride. You know, when you're when you're taking your responsibility, and it makes people feel really good. And the payoff is when they see more birds and butterflies behind their house. Great, right. that's a great point. And I just want to make sure that we understand what John said about um, pollution from cars. And so, pollution from cars includes nitrogen pollution. And so, that's one of the main contributors in the Tampa Bay watershed to the nutrient load into Tampa Bay, as they found. So um, it's not small, car pollution is really um, big. And so when you're thinking about what more can you do to reduce your nitrogen footprint, think about the kind of car you drive and how much nitrous oxide is being produced as a result. So we only have time for one more question and Armando's gonna wrap it up with that last question. With kind of going that direction already, what can you do, that's something that everybody wants to well, a lot of people are interested in what can you do at the individual level and with the understanding that this nutrients being accumulated for a long time so we have we might see changes in many years from now so it's not going to happen very quickly but so what can you do what will you tell the people right well i think sort of following up on my first statement you know um learning more and informing yourselves um you guys are already taking the first step and that's one of the first things that you can do in terms of the, the previous question was about nutrient sources and kind of not to be casual about this, but the, you know, an answer is yes. Basically everything we do is a, a source of nutrients. So whether it's fertilizers on um, uh, the home landscape level or a larger agricultural level, it's fertilizers, stormwater, um, poop. Um, you know, so we were talking about septic systems or if you're in an area that has um, uh, wastewater treatment, you could have faulty infrastructure. There are leaking pipes everywhere. Um, dog poop. I know it sounds funny, but dog poop is a huge contributor to nutrients in certain small watersheds. Um, so really, there's a lot of things that you can do, and it really just depends on whether you want to make personal changes to yourself and your actions at the home level. If you want to empower yourself to um, do larger things at a local or community watershed level. Use that voice for change uh, through your elected officials, through your county commission, through um, development plans. So there's a lot of opportunities for you at the individual and community level to make changes because we're all part of the problem and we're all part of the solution. I have another take on that, and, and that's that a lot of great things are done by groups of people. So it's great to be a person who does the one thing, but it's great to be part of a thing. You, there are many things that can only be done together, by working together. And, and it can be any variety of together. It can be your community, it could be a club, it could be government. And, uh, and I, I'm a government employee, so you pay me. And uh, sometimes people forget America is a participatory democracy. It's built that way. It's built that responsible adults are supposed to participate and vote 
and smart way, and I don't mean just vote, I mean everything. You know, speak up, speak your mind, ask for what you want. Not just in government, in anything, but I really believe working together is far stronger than working alone. Yeah, thank you. And Vince? So, regardless of if a human, human uh, uh, produced nutrients have a small, a large, or no effect on, on red tide, um, you know, there's numerous reasons to reduce nutrient um, input to our, our, our aquatic systems, both freshwater, uh, estuarine, and marine. Um, however, you know, HABs are a worldwide phenomenon. Um, there's different controlling factors for different species and in different regions. And it's really important to understand those factors if we're going to do something about the blooms. And that do something might be to you know, try to try to curb it, try to you know, mitigate the effects, um, try to maybe um, do something that we, to help us control the blooms to make them go away, or you know, to predict it and, and forecast the blooms. So one of the things I think the public can do is to voice their support for our research. Um, both at the local, the state, and the, and the um, national level. I mean, that's really important because we, we need, you know, it, we, we often, uh, I just, I guess, try to avoid saying the word funding, um, but, you know, it's not really for us. It's in order to do the research. And that has to happen at a sustained level. You know, we need to keep doing that research because when funding goes up and down, you know, when it goes down, we have to spin down the research. Then it goes back up, and then we have to gear it up. And when does it usually go up? After we've had a big event. Um, so we've, we've missed, you know, we've missed a lot of potential uh, for collecting a lot of great data prior to that event and then through the event. It usually happens after. And that's happening now. And yes, we're going to spin up a lot of new research. And you know, it could be that this bloom goes away and then we don't have another bloom for a long time. And so we'll have geared up, be collecting all this data, and then funding will go down again and we'll spin it all back down. And then we'll have a big bloom and funding will go up. And that, that cycle is it's not... You know, it's not really sustainable in the sense that it's not going to get us to solutions. So voice your support for HAB research and, and the importance of it. Make sure that the you know officials know that it's uh, you know it's, it's critical. It's it's critical to our uh, it's, it's in the public interest. Dale, you have the last word on that. <laughs> that's share. Yeah, that's bad because everybody said everything up here. <laughs> but no, I echo what you guys have said. But um, for me, when I talk to people, I said, you know, sit down and think about, you know, the our impact, right? It's over really those our impact. How much, how much do you impact the environment? I know that people like to point fingers. Oh, it's agriculture. It's, it's, you know, it's urban areas. This is that. Well, you have to eat, right? Um, you, if you eat meat, let's say those beef cattle, whatever, they have to eat. And that, you know, and that goes, oh, and they also poop, you know, and so do you. And so keep on going back, okay, so are, am I going to try to make everybody become vegetarian? No, not necessarily. But um, that's another question. But uh, and this, and then also the products you use at home. So again, so for me, I told one time a, 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 news, uh, a news reporter, he was trying to make me say whose fault it was. That's what, that's what everybody wants to make it, whose fault. And I said, it was yours. And <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, well, do you eat? Chicken. He goes, yeah. I go, do you know what chickens do to the environment? He goes, well, it's tasty. I go, well, yeah. I said, do you eat beef? Do you eat pork? Do you eat this? I go, yeah. Okay. But I, but then I said, but those also have to eat. How many much cow eats? You know. And then forget you. You also have a salad too, right? And then all that has like all that has to go somewhere, right? You if you eat a lot, you know, poops a lot, and then all that has to do something. And then let's say you overdo. Then it, let's say the sewage. You, you know, there's. It's raining so much, and all of a sudden the, the, the treatment plant just goes over it. And so again, it just over and over again. So again, you know, um, the, we, we we see there's a problem, there's a problem. So voice it, and because I think it's the bottom up approach. Because when we just waiting for the top for the people from the top trying to you know help us, now we have to go up from here. Because you guys know, you guys are here, you guys know the problem. We got to figure out what to do. We got to study it. So so you don't know, just sit down and do nothing, right? But don't, you know, also eat it when you don't stop. Thank you. So let's give a big thank you to our expert panelists. Thank you again to Ridley College, Mark Design, and Tim Robbins specifically for getting us this space. Thank you uh, to Florida Sea Grant for posting this on Facebook Live. Thank you to the water stewards who helped us make this event happen. Drive safely. Yeah, thank you to you for caring.
on the mic cord. Be careful on the cord. Oh my. I am tripping.